Many women find that breast cancer diagnosis and treatment seriously disrupt their sexual lives. First, there are the most obvious issues, the physical changes, exhaustion, nausea, and pain from treatment, self-image, empty energy reserves, and the emotional chaos from the diagnosis itself. But there are, there are also many other issues that women and their partners may not even know they'll have to face. If you are struggling with issues affecting your sexuality, you are not alone. Sex and intimacy can be difficult for most women after a breast cancer diagnosis. Welcome to Health Talk. Today we're gonna to talk about breast cancer and sexual health. I'm Laura Termini, founder of chickenall.com, and let me introduce you to Dr. Kristin Rojas, breast surgical oncologist at Sylvester Comprehensive, Comprehensive Cancer Center. Hi, doctor, how are you? Thank you so much for being here with me today. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. So I have a lot of questions from my readers. So I prepared just a questionnaire so we can go, you know, and talk about this. Can cancer treatments cause sexual problems in women? Yeah, that's a great question. It's the right question. And it's a question that we haven't been asking uh, for a long time. You know, 30 years ago, we didn't even talk about breast cancer, you know, and now we have a whole month dedicated to breast cancer awareness. And so, you know, the next step is treating, now that survival outcomes are so great, and most women um, that are diagnosed with early stage breast cancer live long lives, and now we're really focused on maximizing their quality of life. And when I started as a breast surgeon, I was um, really um, impacted by a couple of my patients who told me that they were experiencing some issues with their treatment. And once I started asking other patients, I realized how common it was. It's actually more than 80% of women with a history of breast cancer experience sexual side effects from treatment. Um, and this can be because chemotherapy, if you have to undergo chemotherapy, can put you into an early menopause. Um, and then the other issue is that sometimes we give women a pill that blocks estrogen, so it can give them some menopausal symptoms and some GYN related symptoms like vaginal dryness, painful sex, and then low libido or low desire. And so we haven't talked about these symptoms for a long time, and I'm so glad you invited me on here to talk about them so we can make them normal conversation. Doctor, but those sexual problems are very common among women anyways. So without even the, having cancer, you know, it's like I hear that. And that's, we, you know, complain with each other about yeah. sexual problems. We don't talk about them on social media, but it's a common problem too. Yeah, you know, as a society, we don't do a great job talking about normal menopausal changes. And a lot of women, as they go through menopause, which in the United States is on average age 51 to 52, we don't do a great job preparing them for that. And we also don't do a good job giving them treatments to manage their symptoms. And so like in general, you know, a lot of the things um, that I recommend to my patients with a history of breast cancer also apply to women who are just experiencing menopausal symptoms. What is the most common question your patients ask about intimacy? Yeah, so the most common question patients ask me about is uh, painful sex because, you know, maybe they were going through treatment um, and they maybe they're partnered or unpartnered. Um, and then, you know, obviously your intimacy or your love life usually takes a back seat with regards to like your diagnosis and getting through chemotherapy. And then treatment's over and they are ready to have be intimate with their partner or to get out there and uh, date again. And they realize that pain, sex feels completely different than it did before. And it's associated with more pain or they may have like a little bit of spotting after sex. And that can be really, really scary for patients. And so my goal is to not only educate them about these changes and help prevent them, but then also treat them when they show up. Uh, will any of these problems uh, would be permanent for a patient? Yeah, that's a really good question because patients are always asking me, you know, is this forever? And, you know, the answer is we used to think that a lot of these symptoms got better with time. And it's true that hot flashes, if you're experiencing pretty bad hot flashes with treatment, those tend to improve. But some of the other GYN related issues like dryness or vaginal pain, sometimes they don't get better if you don't 
treat them. And so that's why I think it's so important that we are talking about this so I can get the word out and um, help everyone start to address these symptoms because they can get better. It won't always be like this, um, but I do tell patients that this is kind of like the new way to address things. So even though you used to, you know, approach sex and intimacy one way, you're going to have to approach it a little bit differently. Now, it doesn't mean it's impossible, it just may take a little bit more work, but it's definitely possible. So it's not going to be the, the sex life that you had before, but you can transform it and have the different kind of sex life with your partner and probably, you know, like rekindle the love or do something different. Yeah, that's exactly right. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be as good. It just might mean it might be a little bit different. And so one of the things I tell patients is, you know, after treatment, your body's a lot different. You know, you may have had a breast surgery. You may be dealing with some pain from that. Um, but also, you know, the vagina and the vulva are different in that they're maybe not as stretchy as they were before. And, and it's normal for the vagina to be stretchy because that's just how women have babies and how sexual, sexual intercourse happens. Um, so once they receive treatment, some of that stretchiness goes away and that can lead to that pain that they have during sex. And so um, it doesn't mean that they won't get back to the same kind of sex life they had before. It just may be one that's like a little bit more creative or involves a little bit more com communication with your partner partner um, to see like what works for you now that maybe you didn't even know about might have worked for you before. And talking about stretchiness, because now that you said it, I, I, I don't know why it popped out in my mind that those kind of like sex toys that they're not that toys anymore because they used to, we used to believe that there were sex toys, but they're more like for sexual health, like the one that you can introduce in your vagina and do the Kegel exercises. And th that helps everybody, you know, yeah. but, but, you know, yeah. for, for a, for a patient who's trying to regain their confidence and their sexual health, what do you think about that? Yeah. So, um, that's really important. You know, in the past, we always used to talk about Kegel exercises and say, everyone do Kegels. And it is actually really helpful for women who are having leaking of urine when they cough or sneeze. We tell them to do a Kegel right before that happens. But sometimes in women who have a history of breast cancer and have been having painful sex, um, what happens is once they start to have that pain, so in your pelvis, it's kind of like a bowl like this of all these muscles that are woven together. And so if one of the muscles starts to spasm, it can cause a lot of pain. And so a spasm is when the muscles tightening without you even realizing it. And so once you start to feel pain, some patients do have those spasms in their pelvis and they don't, can't control it and don't even realize it's happening. For those patients, I do recommend that they see a pelvic floor physical therapist and they work with them to help relax those muscles. So it's actually the opposite of Kegels. So that's why, yeah, so for some women, Kegels are helpful, but for some women who have pain, Kegels may make their pain worse. And so that's why I like to get patients into my clinic so that I can see them and we can figure out what's going on so I can get them the right, um, the right uh, avenue that they need. <laughs> I didn't even know that there was somebody who was like a pelvic floor <laughs> specialist. Yeah, they're <laughs> amazing. Oh my yeah. God. I have a question here mm -hmm. uh, from a reader. Can I have sex during treatment? Yeah, that's a really important question. And so the answer is probably yes. And I'll tell you why yes and why no. So. Um, so I do encourage my patients to continue having sex during treatment because if there's someone who maybe doesn't have sex during treatment or for a while after treatment and then they try to have sex again, sometimes if it's been a long time, it can be even more painful. Whereas if you have sex every once in a while, um, penetrative sex, so sexual intercourse every once in a while during treatment, it can actually help prevent some of that pain later on. That being said, not everybody's partner during treatment. And maybe, you know, uh, it, you don't have to be obviously, but for women who are dating, which is also possible during treatment, you know, it's, um, I always recommend patients have sex 
if they want to have sex, safe sex, you know, like just, um, you know, condoms, if that is appropriate for their life. But um, what I don't want patients to have is if they're receiving chemotherapy, and sometimes women who get chemotherapy, their white blood cell counts are lower and their body can't fight infections as well. So in those women, I would encourage them to just be very cautious about safe sex because I wouldn't want them to have, get an infection when their body uh, has those white blood cells that are really low. So those are the only things. So during chemotherapy, it's a little bit more um, just be careful. Um, but also, if you have a question, everyone can speak to their own oncologist who knows you best, and they'll be able to guide you in the right direction. But it's a myth you can't have sex during treatment, and that's not true. What methods of birth control, oh, this is a good question, are advised for your patients? Yeah, so when thinking about birth control, the first, you know, the most common method is obviously what we call barrier contraception, which is condoms. So condoms are the only form of birth control that protect against pregnancy if used correctly, and also STDs. And so for some women, that's what they need, um, and that works really well when used every time. Um, but the question that also always comes up is what about those types of birth control that have hormones, you know, because a lot of breast cancer um, actually responds to estrogen. And so for those women with a history of breast cancer um, who maybe used to take the birth control pill, we don't recommend that you continue to take the birth control pill after a diagnosis. But there are some women who have a copper IUD, which is the, the intrauterine device. And those women, if that is working for them, they can keep the IUD in place, you know, because those last 10 years, and if that's working for them, then I encourage them to keep that. Um, some women already have a Mirena IUD, which is the IUD that has a little bit of progesterone. And I actually think that for a lot of women, you know, the Mirena IUD or the progesterone IUD makes your periods a lot lighter. And during chemotherapy, it's good to not, um, because you're, you can have an anemia where your blood counts are low. So if you're someone who had really heavy periods and has a Mirena IUD in, and that's going well for you, I'll often advocate for patients to keep that in place instead of removing it. But it always depends on your personal oncologist. Um, and so, you know, as far as birth control pills after breast cancer, um, not always indicated and uh, not always preferred because of the hormones. Now, there are some women who have the type of breast cancer that doesn't respond to hormones, and it's called estrogen receptor negative. And those we kind of approach on a case-by-case -case basis if they really want birth control pills. But usually we try to steer them towards um, a non-hormonal method, which could be the copper IUD. Um, but before having an IUD placed, if you have a history of cancer, just talk to your oncologist so they can walk you through what's best for you. Thank you so much, doctor. I learned so much, and I, I'm very you know, grateful for having you here. And I know that we're gonna help a lot of women with this conversation. So if you want an appointment, you can call 305-243-4902 to make an appointment or to speak to the surgical oncology staff. I know that we are, you know, changing now the society, the way we talk to doctors. So that's why we're here in Chicano. And I'm, I, I'm you know, I, I love having this conversation with you. Thank you so much, Dr for all the insight and all the information. Thank you so much for having me. I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, as a breast cancer surgeon, I usually see patients with a recent history of breast cancer okay. where we're trying to figure out the next step. But this special program that I have that addresses these sexual side effects is a different program. And what I've called it is MUSIC. And that stands for Menopause, Urogenital, Sexual Health and Intimacy. So when you call Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, if you don't need me as a wearing my breast surgeon hat and you want to talk to me for sexual health, ask them for a referral to the music program with Dr. Rojas and they'll know exactly how to schedule you so we can meet. I and we also that. have virtual visits too. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, now we go in Spanish. Just uh, let me let me choose uh, the right questions. Okay. okay. Y estoy con la doctora Christine Rojas y hoy vamos a hablar